Let's get back to Sports and Torts with David Spada and Elliot Harris on TalkZone.com. Gentleman who pitched Chicago White Sox for 11 years from 67 to 78. He was also a Red Sox and Pirate, a three-time All-Star, Wilbur Wood. How you doing, Wilbur? I'm doing fine. So are you ready to start pitching again? Because the knuckleball pitchers are making big money now with this R.A. Dickey. Well, yeah. in my mind, I'm ready, but that's about it. Because, I mean, he's throwing that knuckleball in the low 80s, which is, I've never seen a knuckleballer throw it that hard. No, he does. He throws his real hard. I've, uh, I, you know, of course, back when I was playing, they didn't have guns anyway, so you didn't know how hard you were throwing, but I know I wasn't close to that. He started off as a fastball, curveball pitcher. But your dad taught you the knuckleball when you were in junior high? Well, I was throwing it before then, but uh, <clears throat> I as I signed as a, a curveball fastball pitcher, and uh, my fastball was just a, a few yards too short, so I had to make a change. And you signed with the, with the Red Sox out of high school? Yes, I did, yes. So who was scouting you back then from the Red Sox? Well, it was uh, Neil Mahoney was uh, the, the head scout around here in the Boston area at the time, and uh, and I signed, and, and Neil signed me to a contract after we graduated from high school. So it, it, it's a dream come true, and then you end up going to what? Where Waterloo, Iowa, for a few games, and then uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, and. What's that like for a kid just out of high school to, to be seeing uh, the United States that way? Well, it was it was a great experience, and uh, <clears throat> I had done a little traveling prior to that anyway, not not to that extent, but uh, it was uh, it was a great experience, and I looked forward to it and uh, enjoyed it. Who was on the Red Sox teams in the early '60s? You had Yastrzemski, and who were the other uh, main components? Well, Frank Malzahn was there, and uh, uh, Eddie Pursu was there, Chuck, uh, Chuck Schilling, uh, Schilling, second baseman. Uh, I Dick Stewart was playing first base, and then you had your Skrimsky in the outfield, and it was Gary Geiger, and uh, I'm trying to think, uh, well, Jim Paglaroni was a catcher at the time. Because uh, so, yeah, when you were growing up, the Red Sox, I mean, it's Ted Williams, Bobby Doerr, those guys, right? Oh, yeah. When I was, you know, in, in, in junior high, uh, Ted Williams, Bobby Doerr, Johnny Pesky, they were all there then. So they had to be a dream come true to get drafted by your hometown team. Well, I, I was looking forward to it, and I, I was fortunate to be able to speak to a couple of the Red Sox players prior to signing, and uh, <clears throat> of course that made a big influence on where you might like to go. And you, you, is it safe to say that you struggled in those first few seasons with Boston? I would say I struggled quite a bit. Uh, I, I I don't have a baseball card in front of me, so I don't know what what I had for a record. But uh, I know there were no W's on it. Yeah. So when you so then you get traded to the Pirates there a couple years, and you go to the White Sox, and Hoy Wilhelm basically told you to use a Nick knuckleball exclusively. He told you what not to use the fastball curveball. Well, I mean, we sat down, we talked, and, and he said, if you're going to go with the knuckleball, you know, you've, you've got to throw it. And, uh, you know, you've, you've got to throw it 85 90% of the time to, uh, to really be effective with it. And uh, I was at a point in my career where I had to uh, make a change, and, and I did. And <clears throat> I was fortunate that it worked out well, and, of course, I was always able to throw strikes with whatever I did throw, and, and uh, the knuckleball was just added a career to me. Uh, to me. 
But when you come to spring training and Eddie Stanky says there's no starting jobs and, you know, there's no short relief job, what goes through your head? Well, (laughs) other than what am I doing here? Well, I I wanted to make the ball club, and I I knew why I was picked up. Uh, Because I was a left-hander that could throw strikes, and they wanted someone in in that capacity because their pitching staff was well-stocked. I mean, there's no getting around that. And then it, it, it worked out well. I mean, I... I won a few ball games that year, and uh, I was in several ball games. I had a, a few saves, one or two saves, but uh, it was basically uh, I did the job that they wanted wanted me to do. And this was in the days like now, where you come in for one inning. You were pitching several innings when you came in. Well, the, the game has changed a great deal, so there's there's no getting around that. I mean, it's. Uh, your starting pitcher, if, if the starting pitcher goes six six innings and gives up three runs or less, he had a great start, a great outing. If you did that, you'd be on the bench. If we did that, we'd be out of a job. <laughs> well, you you had seasons where you had 350 innings where you'd pitch. Nowadays, that's like almost two seasons for some pitchers as a starter. Well, it's as I said, it, it's all changed. And like uh, I, I saw Wakefield uh, a couple of years ago at a golf tournament, and uh, <clears throat> we were we were talking, and I said, you know, I said, uh, when you reach three hundred and some innings, give me a buzz, give me a call. <laughs> You're still waiting for that call, right? <laughs> <laughs> well. I, I, I'll be waiting for that call for a long time. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned Wakefield. I was thinking about you when I saw Wakefield when he was pitching because when the Red Sox made him a closer there, I was shaking my head. I'm like, I've never seen a knuckleball as a closer. And then I did a little research and I said, oh, Wilbur Wood was doing that. Yeah, I did that for uh, quite a few years, I guess. Yeah. Would you prefer to come in as a reliever after you have like a fastball pitcher, like a Terry Forrester, one of those guys throwing hard? Tommy John, so that way your knuckleball looks even slower than it was. Well, I mean, it it it, it worked out well uh, uh, both ways for me uh, because I, as I said, I could throw strikes, and that was a, that was the big factor. But uh, uh, it was great to be able to go out there as a starting pitcher and pitch, uh, you know, seven innings and. And then look around, and there's a Terry Forrester coming in behind you, or a Rich Gossage coming in behind you. And uh, I mean, it was lights out. <laughs> I mean, the batters didn't have a chance to adjust. When you came into the game, were the catchers happy, or or unhappy, or because you threw your knuckleball slower than uh, most? They say it's easier to catch. I I don't know how that works. Well, I mean, I I threw mine. Uh, you you varied the speeds on it, and because being in Chicago, <clears throat> you didn't have to worry about who was catching because they had all come up through the organization catching a knuckleball. Because don't forget, Eddie Fisher and Hoyt Wilhelm were there long before I got there. And they'd been throwing it, uh, they'd been seeing the knuckleball for years and years. So it was it was no big deal to who was catching. Whether it be Eddie Herman or Chuck Brinkman, Brian Downing, I mean, they they all caught the knuckleball. They all did a great job with it. And Pete Barney did a great job when he came over. Are, are you surprised there aren't more knuckleball pitchers today? Well, I, I I would definitely love to see more do it, but there's there's many many ball players that have got a good knuckleball, but their only problem is they can't throw it over the plate for a strike, and that's that's the name of the game. 
How long does it take to learn how to throw the knuckleball and throw it for strikes? Is it something you can pick up relatively quickly? Well, it takes practice, but uh, as far as throwing it for strikes, uh, you've got to throw all the pitches for strikes. You've got to be around the plate. And if you're around the plate and you're throwing strikes, then you can do that with the knuckleball. But if you're wild with the curveball or the wild with the slider or wild with the fastball or up and down, you know, you, how are you going to control the knuckleball? Is there weather conditions that were more favorable to you as a knuckleball pitcher, or it didn't matter what the weather was? Well, it's, you know, that's that always made good talk, and uh, <laughs> you, you, you've got to consider the ballparks, and all your ballparks are, the smallest part of the ballpark is around home plate, so no matter which way the wind's blowing, it's bouncing off the stands. So it's, uh, you always said you'd like the wind blowing out, so you're throwing, you know, against the wind, not with it. But uh, usually in most of your ballparks, it, the wind is bouncing off the stands anyway. Was there any batter that had particular success against you? Pardon me? Was there I, any I, batter that had particular success against you in your knuckleball? Oh, oh there were several hitters that, uh, that hit me well. Uh, and just to... Right off the top of my hat, you've got to say a, a, a hitter uh, with Minnesota, Rod Carew. <clears throat> he he hit the uh, he hit the ball very well because he didn't hit the ball just off me. He hit it off everybody. But right. uh, a hitter uh, that was like that that wasn't up there for the hitting, trying to hit the long ball every time up or something like that, trying to get a base hit or hit a double or or what have you, you know, get on base. Uh, he was the, the toughest out you had. And it was, as I said, hitters like that that, that gave you the the, uh, the toughest time. It was uh, your home run hitters, uh, oh, they got you. There's no question about that. But a lot of times, you know, a lot of times home runs don't mean much because the game is out of hand anyway or one way or the other, so it, it, it's no big deal. But you had a better chance of having them pop it up or striking them out. Was was there a hitter that you did not enjoy facing besides, like, Carruthers? Well, if I was throwing the ball good, I didn't care who I, who I faced. But if I wasn't throwing the ball well, I didn't want to face anybody. <laughs> it's as simple as that. It's... it's uh, uh, if you're throwing well, your chances are pretty good. I mean, I, I, I wasn't afraid to face anybody. Did hitters get more frustrated when they would strike out against you, thinking, how did I strike out? That ball's coming so slow, I should be able to pound it. Or did they try to overswing, and that cause more problems? Well, you, know, you have to take into consideration we changed speeds with it. It wasn't always the same speed. And some balls broke quicker than others. Some broke slower than others. But it, it's, uh, you get them out front, they, they, then you get one by them. And it, it, uh, you know, pitching is pitching. Now, you never had a no-hitter or one-hitter, but you had a, three two-hitters, and two of those were in 11 innings. you recall those games? No, I don't. No, no. I don't have a clue. <laughs> Did managers ever worry about you basically getting a tired arm and they figured, you know what, he throws a knuckleball, his arm should never get tired? Well, you get tired and you get sore like everybody else. But uh, by throwing the knuckleball, you're just not adding that extra stress on, uh, stress on your elbow or your shoulder because... You're not throwing, breaking the sliders off or breaking the curveballs off. and, and it, uh, In that respect, it takes a little less out of you. Now, in, uh, I think it was 1976, after Bill Vec had bought the Sox in December of 75, he got to pitch the season opener. Well, what was that one? <laughs> 
Was o- o- opening day a special day for you or just another day of work? Well, at the time, they were all special. Uh, when you got the opportunity to do it, but now you're asking me what was it like. I, I can't remember back then what it was like on opening day. I don't have, I don't have a clue. <laughs> you probably remember, though, starting both games of a doubleheader. Oh, I did that, yeah, yeah. How did that end up happening? Was it just a fluke, or did they have that planned? Well, I, the one I talk about is the time I did it against Cleveland. Uh, it, was a, it was a game that was uh, called because of curfew. And the next night, the next day, I was pitching. and So that we just picked that game up, and it ended up going five or six innings. And uh, Dick Allen hit a two-run homer to win it, and or a three-run homer to win it. And then I, I came out and I pitched the second game and uh, won that. You had a lot of managers you played for. Did you have a favorite manager? Well, I, I played for a lot of uh, great managers, but by far the best manager I ever played for was Chuck Tanner. There was uh, no question in my mind about that. He was... Uh, he was a great man to play for, and uh, he had some great coaches, and uh, we had some real good ball clubs. Okay. What, what was special about Chuck? Well, he, he was a player's manager. He, he, uh, he had very few rules and regulations, and uh, he, as I said, he was a player's manager. He, he stuck by all the players, and... That way, the players stuck by him and the ball club, and uh, you know everyone did a good job for him. Everybody enjoyed playing for him. Growing up, was there one player that you basically idolized or modeled yourself after? Oh, I can't say that. I mean, I followed you know the Red Sox, and of course the Boston Braves were here for a while too. But you know, when I was a kid. But I didn't idolize or, or try to take off off of anyone that uh, was playing. Now, in high school, you were a pretty good quarterback and a pretty good hockey player. Was there any temptation to pursue those sports? Well, I had the opportunity to to, to go to school and play hockey, and uh, uh, of course, I could have gone to school and played baseball also, and <clears throat> but. Then I had the opportunity to sign, and uh, so I I chose that route. So there might have been a line with Bobby Orr in you. Uh no, no, no. <laughs> he, he, he he's in a, he he's in a class all by himself. Well, that wraps up another show. We'd like to thank our guests Martha Joe Black, Wilbur Wood, our executive producer Dave Olson. Uh, Maybe next time David Spada will be in studio with us. I'd like to thank you for tuning in. And we will be back next week on Sports and Torts on TalkZone.com. TalkZone.com.